next species are empty. If you're left empty, even for a year, your probability of survival really plummets. So it's not going to be a bit. It's better to have some ant on you than no ant. Okay, so the next thing we could do is then, and it's another kind of wonky modeling thing, is we can then take the, this matrix model and ask, which of these ants is the sort of best ant for tree fitness? Okay? So what we did was we rebuilt this demographic model and we removed different ants from the model. So we just disappeared certain ant species from the model with the goal of generating, like, what's tree population lambda look like? What's the fitness of this tree population look like if we have just a single species in monoculture of a particular ant species, species A, B, C, or D? We can also ask, what happens to tree population fitness if we have a combination of two species? Any of the possible permutations of those four species broken down into two species communities, or three species, or the four species community that we have. We then can look at population lambdas and see how well the population were growing with those combinations of ants on them. So here's the graph we're going to look at for just a second. Down here is ant species number from one ant sort of occupying the plants in monoculture, to two ant combinations, to three ant combinations, and to four. And this is a 50 year window, it's about a generation time uh, for this tree population. And so what we find, just looking at it right off the bat, is unsurprising. We have trees that are occupied solely by a monoculture of an antagonistic ant that helps a beetle to kill off the tree, don't do well, a population that very low lambda. Trees that are occupied solely by a sterilizing parasite also don't do very well, as you might expect, right? Trees that are occupied by Cumanagaster mimosi are putative good mutualist. Actually, not the highest uh, single ant fitness um, promoter. And so that was a little bit surprising. Tetrapronera pensii occupied trees are actually, if in monoculture, doing the best. OK, so now what I want to do is back off of this graph for a second, focus just on, say, uh, a, a population of trees that's solely occupied by our, what we used to think of as the absolute best mutualist out there, Chromatogaster mimosi. So if we take Chromatogaster mimosi and we add a sterilizing parasite to the mix, okay, so that now over the course of the life history of the tree, the tree can now be occupied by either Chromatogaster mimosi or by Nigriceps or by both over the course of its life, what we find is that tree population fitness goes up. So the population lambda, the growth rate of the tree population, actually increases when we add a sterilizer to the mix. So from mimosi to mimosi plus nigriceps, we get a little bump in fitness. Okay? And interestingly, as we add the little black chunk, right, which is chromatogaster nigriceps, to these little pies, and we add a sterilizing parasite to the mix, we generally tend to get increases in fitness at the, at the tree population level. So we have increases in long-term tree population growth rates as we add a sterilizer into the mix. And if we look at the whole community in general, what we find is that as we add more species, even though it's with really motley crew of associates, right, we tend to get increases in tree population growth rate over uh, generation time. So that's interesting, right? And I, I, one of the greatest disappointments of my professional career was that when we got this result, I really wanted to call the paper The Joy of Sets. It's just such a great title, right? Sets of these mutualists are, are joyful. <laughs> they promote, they promote uh, greater, greater plant population growth rates than individuals on their own, despite the fact that one is a parasite, one's a castrator, one's a weak protector, and there's only one, quote, good mutualist. Unfortunately, the journal have we tried to submit this paper to with this title said so we we eschew the use of they actually said eschew the use of puns in our titles or something like that <laughs> or humor I think they said humor is drier um, and so we had to call it something else but the idea is right that, that sets of these mutualists are actually better for these trees than than uh, the single one that we thought was the best associate so how does that work well the way it works. Uh, can be discerned if we look at the sensitivity of lambda, the tree population, to survival and reproduction. So if you do a sensitivity analysis um, of, of the of tree populations from very small trees up to bigger trees, and these are just graphs showing how sensitive is lambda or tree population growth rate to survival, right? And how sensitive is lambda as trees get larger and larger and larger to reproduction? It turns out what we <coughs> expect is that survival elasticities are very high when trees are smaller, right? Trees that are younger don't reproduce, so it doesn't really matter if they reproduce or not. And so lambda is not uh, real sensitive 
to reproduction at small tree heights. As trees get bigger, survival becomes less and less important for the host plant, and reproduction uh, uh, becomes more prominent, right? Reprodu reproduction becomes much more important. Well, remember, Tetrapodera pensigae and Chromatogaster nigricept are early successional associates of these host plants. They're great colonists. And so they tend to show up on host plants when those trees are young. And it turns out when those trees need to survive the most, they don't need to reproduce. They just need to survive. And they're getting a sterilization parasite that while that plant is occupied by that ant, it's sterilized. But as soon as the ant is displaced by a more dominant competitor, it, the plant grows more, right? produces more flowering shoots, and then it's released from that sterilization. And so in effect, the tree is kind of getting what it needs at early life stages when it's occupied by the sterilization parasite. And because that sterilization parasite is early successional, it's very likely to be replaced as the plant gets older by an ant that actually uh, promote, either promotes reproduction at a fairly high rate or at a very high rate as the tree sort of tries to deal with the fact that it's been invaded by all these serums and beetle larvae. So the tree is, in a, in a sense, getting what it needs, right, as it grows through its life stages by being occupied by sterilization parasites that promote growth and slow growth promoting ants, both of which are very unlikely to abandon the tree, therefore promote high survivorship. And then as the trees get older, the trees essentially are trading off uh, survival for reproduction as they get older. So it raises this question, we're trying to study mutualisms by doing these sort of pairwise interactions over shorter time scales, when a lot of the mutualists we're interested in are these longer-lived critters that interact with many shorter-lived partners. And I would argue that uh, we need to start thinking more about how the effects of these different partners integrate over the long term to influence fitness. All right, so that's the end of mystery number one. Mystery number two, how do costs out, or do costs in this mutualism outweigh the benefits? And I want to roll this little video for you again. And I just want you to think about how costly is it to support this level of activity for a host plant. Because in a sense, the only carbon, or the primary source of carbon that's going into these ants is coming from the host plant. So the tree is paying for this level of activity. And imagine paying for that level of activity multiple times a day as these ants freak out, as the trees are disturbed by browsers and things like that. Um, that carbon cost is potentially quite large. So we did this experiment in which we removed ants from host plants um, over this a five-year period. I mentioned it briefly before. And when I came up to this experiment in the field, I remember driving up to these trees and thinking, it worked. This is great, because we did it in a paired way. And I could see my treatments. And I was like, oh, that tree that's growing uh, really poorly, that's the ant removal tree right over there. And there's the tree with the ants present. And they're doing a great job defending. It's all lush and lovely and perfect. And it turned out that when I got closer and looked at the tags, I was like, oh, no, it's the opposite, right? And what was really weird was that trees, the trees looked better, and they were growing more, and they had more lush canopies. And then when we got closer, we looked at herbivory. The herbivory was higher on the trees that didn't have ants. They were, they were getting nailed by, you know, lots of things. Elephants, beetles, uh, stem-dwelling insects, leaf uh, chewing, uh, urban wars, and things like that. Um, a lot more herbivory on those plants that looked so great, but they were just essentially using tolerance, right? They were just tolerating herbivory and growing more. And so they were really lush and really looking great, um, despite o overall higher levels of herbivory that they had on them. So then we thought, well, maybe they're trading off um, you know, they're getting hammered more, they're growing, but they're trading off with reproduction. Well, it turns out that trees that are unoccupied by ants reproduce more as well. So are these ants a bad case of fleas, right? Is it, is it, is it possible that, that, that this is really not a mutualism of more, more of a parasitic relationship? So these are data that I showed you earlier, the five-year ant removal experiment for chromatic estrogenicept, but these are the data for all the different all the four ant species. And the pattern was the same for all the chromatogaster species. When you have ants present, they grow less, they reproduce less, um, even though they're getting more herbivory on them. Uh, not, not a significant difference for chromatogaster mimosae, but uh, pretty highly significant for both Shasta and nigriceps. And then Tetrapoder and Pensigai, interestingly, did not show this trend. 
Turns out Tetrapillar and Penzagai, as a strategy to avoid getting taken over by other ants, destroys all the nectaries on its host plants. So it actually shuts down nectar production on the trees. And so it's not suffering that cost of the mutualism. And so when you remove the ants, it doesn't grow anymore, probably because it's not, they're not paying that high nectar cost to the ant associated in the first place. So whether the ant is present or not doesn't matter in terms of carbon costs to the plant. So how do the costs of a mutualism outweigh the benefits? Think about that for a minute. And I don't know about you, but I pay this lizard. Do you have Geico in Canada? Thank God. <laughs> so this might be a culturally um, sensitive joke, or not sensitive, but it's relevant. So I pay this lizard $1,200 a year, right? For what? For nothing. If, if you were an alien looking down at me or you're writing a check, so you'd say, this is waste, right? You're paying this high cost. You're never getting a, be a benefit at all. Right? Well, what is the benefit? Why do I pay Geico? It's because I'm worried about the bad day, right? I'm worried about driving down the interstate and I'm texting and I'm sending some, you know, I'm changing the music and when and suddenly I climb onto the back of a van and I'm crunched into the car and the helicopter has to come and all that, right? That's why I pay. So I'm worried about the bad day. That's when Geico, and it's a rare thing for that to happen, but when it happens, you want to have that lizard paid off, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> Where am I going with this? What's a bad day to a tree? A bad day to a tree looks something like this. Um, this is an African elephant, and it represents a very bad day to a host plant. Um, I couldn't believe this at first, but it turns out that elephants are an important part of this story. Um, and this became really clear to me, so this is the last mystery, our ants bad defenders. Um, became really clear to me in a really bad drought year one year. And I kind of noticed peripherally, I don't know, I almost never see, and in fact I never see elephants feeding on these trees. In a really terrible drought year, elephant populations were being devastated, uh, family groups were splitting up into smaller and smaller subunits, wandering, trying to fend for themselves. And this was the scene we saw repeatedly. This is an acacia mellifera tree that just happened to be growing within this acacia drapanolobium area. And the mellifera was obliterated, just completely trashed. And all of the acacias that were protected by ants were standing. And this is in a tough year for elephants. They weren't eating these ant plants. And so I thought, is it possible these ants could be effective defenders of plants from elephants? It almost seems impossible to believe. But got to do the experiment, right? So manipulated the density of ants on plants and looked at the number of large branch systems that were basically trashed by elephants over just an 18-month period and found, sure enough, there's a negative relationship. The more ants you have on a plant, the less likely it is that elephants are going to start chowing down on that tree. So that was one little piece of evidence. Still wasn't convinced. So the next step was take some of their plants. You know, one obvious potential interpretation of those data are that or is maybe acacia drapanolobium just doesn't taste good to elephants. It's not palatable. It doesn't have the right you know, nutrient ratios or whatever the elephants need. So perhaps I'm just avoiding it because it doesn't taste good. So we took, um, we got some permission to work with orphaned elephants down at uh, an orphanage down near Boy in Kenya. And we essentially worked with a bunch of six to eight year old young ones. And we provided them with a choice of branches. So we did a little cafeteria experiment. And we took one of their favorite foods, acacia mellifera, and then we took acacia drapanolobium. And what we did was, on some of the trees, um, we added ants to the acacia drapanolobium and also to the acacia mellifera. So we added ants to these branches and put them in the piles and said, help yourselves, guys. And the elephants came out, and they were like, there's ants on these things. We're not interested. <laughs> Right? So this is just probably of use using some uh, ox regression models. So when ants are present on their favorite food plant, and when ants are present on acacia drapanolobium, they want nothing to do with the plants. They put their trunk over them and kind of sniff, and they're like, yeah, no thanks. If you take the ants off of these branches, um, they don't show a preference. So they equally uh, eat, feed on acacia drapanolobium and acacia mellifera. So we have a little behavioral data suggesting, okay, at least these orphan elephants really don't like to eat uh, plants with ants swarming on them either. And that you know, kind of makes sense. But it's an elephant, right? It's huge. These things eat trees. They like, happen to be worried about an ant. So the last piece of this story is we decided to look at landscape scale uh, consequences. And so we had this uh, fortunate case in Lake Kipia that elephants have been on the increase over time. This is the number of individuals per square kilometer. And over the course of a period from 2003 to 
2008, about five, uh, five years, elephant density, density is basically tripled in Lycipia. And what we did was we went out and we found a bunch of habitats in which elephant fences, elephant proof fences, had been erected back in 2003. And we could look at them uh, in 2008 and look at the amount of uh, tree cover in those, in those land, land areas. And so what we did was, what you're looking at here is just a kind of a chop out of a map. This is a chunk of land. The red is the elephant proof fence, green is grass cover, and black is tree cover. Okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at how many trees disappeared in red soils. Okay, so this is the habitat that does not support acacia ant plants. Okay, so these are all acacias without ants that are not protected by ants in red soils. We took a bunch of those properties where elephant fences had been erected back in 03, and a bunch of properties in black cotton soils where all the acacias are protected by ants back in 2003. And what we can do is look at over the course of time during which elephant densities increase a lot, do we see a decline in tree cover outside of those elephant fences? And sure enough, in 2008, what we found consistently from one plot to the next was that we get a big disappearance of tree cover outside of the elephant fence, right, five years later when elephant densities have increased, where acacias are not protected by ants. However, and, and as you can see on the inside of the elephant proof fence, densities are not changing, in fact, they increase slightly. In black soils, we saw no difference again and again and again. Inside and outside of those uh, two habitat types, no change in tree cover. So this was kind of the last piece of convincing me like, yeah, elephants are deterred strongly from catastrophic herbivory by ants. And what that means, so an ant weighs five milligrams. <coughs> and I did the math, an elephant weighs five billion milligrams. And so it's a defender that's a billion times, well, an elephant's a billion times more massive than this defender. But in aggregate, right, 200, 300, 400 ants swarming on this elephant are pretty effective at deterring herbivory on these plants, even in tough years when elephants were suffering. So these tiny little defenders are regulating tree cover at eco or sort of landscape scales um, in this system, which is kind of a fun, <coughs> fun result. Just to summarize, um, okay, so I've kind of knocked it over the head a few times. Studying these interactions as pairwise interactions and in isolation and for a short periods of time can be misleading, right? Because the fitness of these plants is determined by the sort of integrated effects of multiple partners. And the, it, it turns out that the timing and the duration and the sequence of those partnerships really matters. So you can have uh, a, a, a system in which you have acacias interacting with two different ant species, say one is a sterilization parasite and one is not, and the order in which those partners arrive on the plant really matters. It's not just that chromatogaster nigriceps, the sterilizing parasite, has an effect that can be quantified in isolation and understood that way. You have to understand who's come before it, who may come after it um, in that sequence over the course of the plant's lifetime to really get at lifetime fitness. Um, and thirdly and finally, these rare events can impose really potent selection. The piece of the elephant story that we didn't get was that there are huge drivers of, of the evolution of this association, um, but they don't hit trees all the time. You can do a five-year ant removal experiment and not see any catastrophic elephant herbivory, and then do a one-year experiment in a different year and just get lucky and elephants come in and mow everything down. And so these really rare events, um, though rare, can be very potent selective forces um, in, this, in this association. So, we have to update the Mutualist Facebook page, of course, um, from, you know, where this is going. In your relationship <laughs> and, that. Um, and it turns out that accounting for this complexity is really important, right? Because the, the entire sort of, um, our understanding of the stability and evolution of mutualism is predicated on how does all this stuff, all this variability out there in nature, um, integrate to impact lifetime fitness. And I, so my, my argument is that we really need to start to think uh, at, at broader temporal um, and perhaps spatial scopes as well to, to get at how these interactions evolve and persist. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, thank you to Rowan for the invite, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.